tell you, I feel very far away from you, so I'm going to scoot myself a little closer if please, that's okay. Please do. Please do. <laughs> scoot all the way. It feels very much us versus them, and we're all together <laughs> trying to solve very big problems. Apparently, you needed to be surrounded by two women. <laughs> This is how I've lived my life, so my mom and grandmother would be proud. Thank you. You should be very, very comfortable with us, right? I am. Now. I am, actually. <laughs> and what a topic to cover. So when I was asked by MasterCard to join in this conversation, I was particularly thrilled because what you are all trying to achieve is the dream of so many millions of people worldwide. My personal story I will share with you that my grandmother was married off in Colombia at 13 years old. By the time she was 26 years old, she had eight. How's that? <laughs> I was getting to the crux of the story, guys. No, so by the time my grandmother was, this is going to be, here we go. By the time my grandmother was 26 years old, her husband, who was 12 years her senior, said that it was too much responsibility and left her with an eighth grade education to care for eight children. She is of Afro-Latino descent in Colombia, so it's the barriers that she faced were insurmountable. But she deeply believed in education. So she worked hard to ensure that every single child of hers had at least a high school education. For folks who understand the socioeconomic disparities of Colombia, that's not easy. My, grandma, my mother, who had a high school education, came to this country with a very clear focus of what I needed to do. And that was to graduate from high school, from college, and get a higher degree. Now that sounds nice, but it was hard because as an immigrant child navigating systems with the expectation of going to college but not knowing how, I needed to better understand that it was my mother's dreams, my job, and thank goodness for government partnerships, because I am the recipient and the product of Pell Grants. Now, my story is not unique to the American Latino experience. What most folks don't realize is that the person that is our custodians, the ones that are mowing our lawns, they are entrepreneurs, and their products are their children, their investment. And as we get into this conversation about the power of education, not only transforming their personal lives and the lives of their community, but the impact that that transformation has on whole economic and democratic systems. And there's no better person to share this stage with than with individuals who recognized that education centered around women change the world. So with that, I'm so excited to be here with both of you for the work that you're both doing to ensure that we're achieving this. So Melinda, I want to start with, <laughs> thank you. So Melinda, I want to start with you very simply because in reading your journey, you talked very much about the importance of how language matters. How when you started, it was very much about women's empowerment but you transformed it and says, no, women's power. What does that mean? Okay, I, I will talk to that, but I'm going to say one thing too also just to give a little background. My parents, my dad was um, an engineer. There were four children in the family, two girls. I'm the second of two girls and then two boys. And my parents were absolutely determined that all four of us would go to college. And we could look around and see that my dad's engineering salary was not going to put four of us through college in the United States because they saw that as the opportunity. They saw what it had done for my dad, who was first generation to go to college. And so I, they started a small real estate business with about 14 rental properties. And I was the one who mowed the lawns and who easy off the ovens because that income was what put me through college. So today when I sit on a stage like this and talk about women and how do we ensure they have their full power, you know, we've talked so long as a development community about empowering women, but if we just talk about empowering women, we're, we're not looking at all the societal barriers that hold them back. And what we really need to talk about is how do women have their full power, which means having decision-making authority, having seats at the table, setting policy, having control of their finances, having control, of course, of their bodies. Um, but when we have to make sure that what we do in society elevates women into their full position 
positions of power or we will never create the society that I think we all dream of, of creating. And I think that's absolutely right. And that's one of the reasons why education is so integral to making sure that folks get out of poverty. So Trevor, can you talk a little bit about what your vision is? You started in South Africa, but the Trevor Noah Foundation is actually growing exponentially. Talk a little bit about it, please. Well, on, on my side, I would often be asked um, the how. You know, people would say to me, oh, how did you get here? How are you in the US? How do you travel around the world? How, how, how? And while there were a myriad of reasons that probably were the reasons that I got to where I got to, that there, was, there was one kernel of truth that I always came back to, and it was education. It was education that had bled throughout my entire family. It was education that had affected every single generation of who I became. You know, I, I think of the, the, the meager education that my grandmother and my grandfather got and how that education and how they valued it became what they instilled in my mom. And then I, I look at my mom who grew up in, in apartheid South Africa in a country where uh, black people were restricted from learning and then a woman was even told that she needs to learn even less because her role in society doesn't require that. And here she was, who, she insisted on teaching herself and learning in spaces. But Again, I think of you know the fact that she only learned what she learned because she encountered missionaries in the trans sky who were teaching despite what the apartheid government was saying. And then I look at how she then instilled that within me. You know, my, my mom never wanted to buy me nice clothes, never we couldn't afford any of these things, but the money that she did have, she would spend on books. The money that she did have, she would spend on school. She would find a way, you know, she'd get me scholarships or whatever it would be to get me to learn. And I think the thing that I, I, I realized throughout my life was it's the foundation of everything. You know, I, I've been lucky enough to meet some of the most powerful, some of the richest people in the world. And you know what's really fascinating is you'll talk to somebody who has, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars, whatever it is. And what's interesting is you'll say to them, what if you, you, you lost it all today? What, what, what would happen? And they, and they look at you and they'll say, well, the difference is now I know how to make it. And that's what's always interesting to me, is that the true power comes in the education that they have in that space, knowing how to source funding, knowing how to grow their money, knowing how to sustain a business, all of these things, that's education. And so when I realized that, I, I, I realized that I wanted to be part of creating not just a conversation, but an incubator that would try and create an environment where we could try and you know, have young people in South Africa who could become that, that, that first step where we would say to them, we're going to help you. We're going to help you get in touch with the business. We're going to help you get in touch with a major company. We're going to help you get in touch with your career path long before you would have gotten access to it. And we're going to get you in touch with the basics as well. You may not have a door in your classroom. You may not have a classroom to begin with. Let's begin with the basics and then let's get you to that place where you have an education that is far larger than just what is a perennial river and what is a cumulonimbus cloud. Just really educating you about the world that you're going to need to exist within. And that's, that's what we, we do at the Trevor Noah Foundation. What's so powerful about that is that I remember when I was growing up, my mother always said, the only thing someone cannot take away from you is what you learn. Yeah. And one of the things that we're learning coming out of the pandemic are the massive inequities and fault lines that the pandemic showed us. We are right now on the eve of the World Bank. One of their topics is inclusivity and making sure that women are part of that equation. Melinda, what we saw during the pandemic, though, was the vast inequities among women, but also the great opportunities that we can because the rest of the world faced it equally and reset. So what opportunities do you see today that could be a catalyst for change because there's an understanding globally of the need for women's participation? Yeah, I think one of the things that's important to realize about the pandemic is what it did was just expose these gaps right. that were already in society. And so who was hit the hardest? The people that were where the gaps and the cracks were. And so when I look out and think about, okay, so what's the opportunity? I mean, you know, as Trevor said, education is is it's foundational. My parents wanted all four of us to be college going. They were determined. 
I honestly have not met a parent in any country, and I talk, I try to be on the ground and talk to lots of people when I travel, a parent who doesn't want their child educated. Because if you educate your child, they see the opportunity. What I feel like we're missing at some of these conversations today is the world is in a tough place. Food prices for people all over the world, the war in the Ukraine, all these compounding crises and the economic scarring from COVID. But we're talking, luckily, about climate, because that's really important. But we're not talking about this amazing opportunity. Women are economic engines of growth. And so when they have their own digital bank account on their mobile phone, which is, it's all over the world. You can't go anywhere and not see it. But when you look at certain countries that survived better through COVID and whose economies actually survived better, take India, in the last 10 years, women have grown from having 28% of women having a mobile digital bank account to 78%. And so if we do certain things to really look at this opportunity we have with women, make sure they have a great education, mm -hmm. make sure they can plan and space the births of their children, and then making sure they have networks to get into a great job and a mobile money and part of the banking system to save money, you will absolutely accelerate their growth. And guess what? They're going to accelerate your economy. Well, and I think around that is how do we actually transform systems that ensure that accessibility? And so what I found really interesting in learning more about your foundation, Noah, is how you focus very much not just on students, but ensuring that teachers are well-equipped. Right. And by what I mean by that is that I think that many of us who have kids that are school-aged, we learned that during the pandemic, teachers weren't just teaching. But they were a source for social well-being, for balance. Talk a little bit how you are centering teachers as well so that they are equipped to talk not just about one plus one, but also about under, re recognizing perhaps the underlying issues that a child may have at home. So a lot of how I see the world has been shaped by the way my mom sees it and how she educated me. And... One of my favorite things that she instilled in me is a yearning to see the causations and the correlations in society. I think we often take those for granted. We will talk about learners, children. Let's educate them. Let's get them educated. Let's do the education. But oftentimes, we then neglect the teachers. Who are the educators? Who are these people who are teaching? Who teaches the teachers? You take that for granted. Do the teachers have the resources they need? You take this for granted. And, and, and in many ways, I think of it like a, like a leaking bucket. You know, sometimes we, we focus so much on pouring water into these buckets that we don't think about the buckets themselves. Are they holding the water that we pour into them? And, and in the foundation, we, th we think of all of these things. So we go, one fantastic teacher has the ability to shape thousands of lives. And yet oftentimes people don't think of that. They don't think of the investment in that teacher being the investment in a thousand young people's lives. Those become the pillars. Those become the caissons that you build this entire foundation on. And, and so we, we look at that. We train teachers. We empower them. We give them tools. We give them access to education. We give them access to mental health facilities sometimes because that's what they need. And you see the net result. You see the, the students experiencing a different environment that then helps them grow. And you see the teachers enjoying it. You, you want teachers to stay in the profession. You want them to grow in the profession. I hate the idea of teaching being like a charity profession. Why not be able to teach and ball out of control? You're doing the best for the world. <laughs> you know. And so I want to be part of a world where we say that is a cool job to have because it's a necessary job to have. And, and I, I try and think of this for, for everything in the world. You know, it's funny you're saying about the dots, and I always talk to you about this, like the dots around the world. Sometimes we we make the mistake, and I understand it's 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 reflective, it's reflexive as humans. We're very good at looking at the now, and we make the mistake of then reacting to the now and then not thinking about the next now. What will the next now be ahead of time? Mm -hmm. So the pandemic, the warning signs were there, and then we, we 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 didn't listen to them. The same goes for what's happening now in the world. You know, you look at what's happening in Ukraine and how the world is supporting Ukraine, everything they're doing. It's valiant and it's wonderful. But then I often say to the world, why not have that same impetus and that same power and energy when you're helping developing nations? Because though it's not an immediate war, it's not an immediate crisis, it is a tidal wave that will affect the entire planet. You know, if, if you have a continent like Africa, 
That is the youngest and fastest growing continent on the planet. Everyone gets excited by that. Oh, economic growth, this is fantastic, this is wonderful. Yeah, but if the people can't access it, you're gonna have an entire continent of young people who have no access to an economy, no access to growth, no access to money, no access to a future, and then what happens? Well, We've seen time and time again what happens. Yeah. They I slip into some sort of extremism, and then people will say, well, let's get money to fight the extremism, let's send the jets, let's send the missiles. Yeah, but why not spend the money now on a missile of compassion that gets the people out of that? You get what I'm saying? I w can I build on this? Because I think you're completely right. Like. I've traveled to many African countries over the years, but like when I go to Kenya and I see the dynamism and you meet these young entrepreneurs and they are getting their businesses and then they need to get capitalized. Like so often we don't look at, okay, how do we then capitalize their businesses? But when you see the dynamism that's there, I mean, the mobile banking all really started in Kenya. I mean, now right. you see it all over the world, but it was there early and look how far they've taken it now and then look how other countries have built on that so there is this unbelievable amount of talent that is just waiting to have the right teacher the right mentor the right capitalization of their build of their business and i think back to like on my education somebody asked me this morning like who is the most influential person in your life so many people answer their teacher I had a female teacher who brought computers into our school. I would never have studied computer science without that. I never would have gone to Microsoft. And so I think of all this amazing talent yeah. that I see in all these countries, and I think, why aren't we tapping into that and funding that? And so as we come to these big meetings at the World Bank and the IMF, we need to be thinking about not just the immediate crisis, but absolutely, let's make that an engine of investment and growth for the world. And I think something, Trevor, that you're talking about, too, and what you're saying is the importance of access to capital and thinking big, and not leaving anybody behind. But you conversely alluded to something else. In a world right now, we, we're oftentimes, as the President of the United States says, that we are living right now in a struggle between democracy and autocracy. Mm -hmm. Democracy is oftentimes thrives in stable countries in middle-income countries, and in educated countries. The reason I dedicated my work to Voto Latino is that just like in Africa, the median age is 19 years old. In the Latino community here in America, as the second largest group of Americans, it's 30 years old. It's three years younger than India. But this, get this, in the Latino community, while the co most common age in the United States of whites is 58, mm -hmm. and African Americans is 32. It's 11 years old. And so when we're talking about the importance of galvanizing people and making sure that they are educated and actively participating, it's important to recognize that it's not just the economic well-being of a global system, but it's also the democratic well-being of a global system. Talk a little bit about that. So personally, I don't believe that there is any type of democracy if people are not financially included, if people are not able to participate in the world that they live in, if people are excluded from growing and building what they do, then, then it, there is no democracy to celebrate. I think people take this for granted. People often say, oh, why is, why is, uh, you know, why are these autocracies growing around the world? Or why are these dictatorships growing around the world? There's a direct correlation between how people are living and what they are experiencing and what they're trying to do. A populist will take advantage of a situation where people are what? Starving, undereducated, and frustrated. So if you want to solve the problem, don't tell people to vote differently. Make them live in a world that makes them want to vote differently. People are responding to something that is happening to them. You know, and so it, it's often easy for people to preach down and say, oh, how could they vote this way? How could they do? Because people are voting for rapid change. People are voting for radical change. Unfortunately, the people who promise it often don't deliver it. But then those who come from a lofty position and say, ah, oh, we will be patient, and we, they often don't see that they're thinking top down as opposed to bottom up. And so in all these conversations, you often hear people say, oh, you, you know, with women, and that's why I love when you say like the power of women. I think we also take for granted 
how much it alleviates the pressure on men. I think that's one of the biggest parts of the conversation that we take for granted. We make it seem like it's this wonderful do good thing that we will do for women, but time and time again you see you give a woman the power she deserves, you give her the equity, you give her the inclusion, the household changes, the society changes, the pressure that men feel changes. And when that pressure changes, you then just start to see a society that stabilizes itself. And there's, it's just, it's a little more peaceful. It's a little more calm. It's, a, it's just, it's a more pleasurable place to be. And I, I think sometimes <laughs> when we think to ourselves, oh yeah, no, let's do this. It's not doing it for the ladies, no. No, it's not that. You want a balanced household. Sort of is. Which gives you... No, no, but I'm saying you're not doing it for. It's not the for. You know, you, you, you're going, we're doing it for us. And, and I think once we think of it through that lens, you know, anyone can tell you if they grew up in a household where mom and dad earned an income, that was a very different household. If you grew up in a society where women had access to money, I'll tell you now from Africa, I, that's one thing we've learned time and time again. Give your grandmother the money. See how long that money lasts in the house. Give your aunt the money. See how long that money lasts in the house. A dollar goes a lot further when it's in a woman's hands. And it's not because men don't have the ability to hold that dollar, but it's because for so long, women have borne the brunt of not having the dollar. And so I think they think about that very differently. And so I think if we create that equity that, you know, I love your foundation working on, we just create a space where as men, we get to go like, okay, we get to breathe a little bit more. And the economy that we're always chasing, it will grow. It's a byproduct of a world that is well run. Let me just, one thing I want to just add to this is I was speaking with a woman in the last couple of years in a low-income country, and she had finally gotten some economic means in her hands and had control of it. And she literally said, my son sees me differently because I bought him a bicycle. My husband sees me diff differently because I can buy fuel for his motorcycle. Everybody in my community knows my name now. And that's why I think we have to talk about money and women having their own financial means in their hands because then she has her power and then it does change and the world just gets better just for all the reasons you said. It absolutely does. And I know that I have one more question that I really want to ask you, Melinda, because it's very much on this idea of conversing, of being able, when you vote, you actually vote in change. One of the things that we learned that is one of the reasons why women are not being integrated into the workforce fast enough is that the lack of childcare. And one of the, the Inflation Reduction Act of the President Biden included to make sure that women's childcare was covered here in the United States. You recently announced with the World Bank that that is also a very important part for women internationally. The vice president was just recently in Africa and announced that that investment. And for if I understand right, what you're saying is that that investment of having women who have childcare, it will basically produce globally a gross domestic product of $3 trillion. You have the last word. What does that mean to you? That means to me, we have to look at this dual burden that women have. We expect women to care for the children. Some of it's loving care work they want to do. Some of it is laborious tasks. But without a place to safely put their children they cannot go into the labor force. I hear it from women in Kenya. I heard it from scientists in Senegal I just met with. I hear it in the United States. We have the worst, the worst paid family medical leave policy in this country. And so why are women coming out of the workforce? Why is women's labor force participation down? Two, in two thirds of the country around the world after pandemic, women's labor force participation is down. The number one reason is they don't have a quality, safe place to put their child. We've got to fix that. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you to our audience. Thank you.